Stanford University. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. I have to say, I, uh, well, I've been thinking a lot about the humanities at Stanford and worrying. I'm a, the senior associate dean of the humanities, and I've been worrying about, you know, are the humanities still living? And uh, this audience is a wonderful wake-up call um, to the importance of the humanities. So anyway, I want to welcome you all here tonight. Um, as I said, I'm, my, my name is Deborah Satz, and I'm a professor of philosophy. I direct um, the Center for Ethics and Society. And as I said, I'm senior associate dean for the humanities and arts at Stanford. And I'm delighted um, to welcome you to this evening's conversation with Tim O'Brien, who was invited by the Stanford Humanities Center to be with us tonight as the 2011 Raymond West Memorial Lecturer. The Raymond West Memorial Lecture Series was established in 1910 by Mr. and Mrs. Frederick West of Seattle in memory of their son, who'd been a student at Stanford. This lecture series brings outstanding speakers to the university for public lectures every other year, and these are presented as part of the Presidential and Endowed Lectures in the Humanities and Arts, sponsored by the President's Office and administered by the Humanities Center. Is there an echo? No, okay, I hear the echo, just. Um, tonight's event is also part of a year-long campus exploration of the ethical issues raised by war. This series asks questions such as, is war ever justified? Is it ethical to kill non-combatants? When is it legitimate to intervene in another country's affairs? Is a volunteer army morally preferable to a military draft? What does patriotism mean in a time of war. This is a very important series, and I urge all of you who are interested in these issues to check out. Um, it's on the Ethics and Society website, is information about um, upcoming events in this series. Tim O'Brien will also be giving a reading tomorrow night at 7 here in Coverly, and based on tonight's experience, I would say get here early. Um, Tim is in conversation tonight with Tobias Wolf, the Ward W. and Priscilla B. Woods Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences at Stanford. Toby Wolf is the author of the novels The Barracks Thief and Old School, The Memoirs, This Boy's Life, and In Pharaoh's Army, and the short story collections In the Garden of the North American Martyrs, Back in the World, and The Night in Question. After tonight's conversation, there'll be some time for questions, and I see that there are mics. I don't know if there are any mics up at the top, but there are mics down here, and people can line up by the mics. Okay, so much for the overall logistics. Now I'd like to briefly introduce Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien was born in Minnesota and attended McAllister College, where he graduated summa cum laude and was immediately drafted. That was in 1968. He was sent to Vietnam in 1969 and served with the US Army's 5th Battalion, 46th Infantry, which was to become infamous due to its involvement in the My Lai Massacre the previous year. In an interview, he recalled, quote, when the unit, when the unit I went with got to Vietnam in February 1969, we all wondered why the place was so hostile. We didn't know that there had been a massacre there a year earlier. My life figures prominently in his book, In the Lake of the Woods, and of course speaks to many of the issues posed um, in this series. But Tim O'Brien is not simply a war writer or a Vietnam writer. In his own words, I don't write about bombs and bullets, I write about the human heart it, that is war, is the subject matter that was given to me. At the same time, so many of the ethical issues involved in war are addressed in his work. The elusiveness in memory and truth, the horrors of war, the strains posed by war on the human heart. 
Upon completing his duty, tour of duty, O'Brien went on to graduate school at Harvard and received an internship at the Washington Post. His writing career was launched in 1973 with the release of If I Die in a Combat Zone, Box Me Up and Ship Me Home, about his war experiences. The author of eight books, Tim O'Brien has received national and international recognition for his work. He received the National Book Award in Fiction in 1979 for his novel, Going After Cacciato. Cacciato. In 2005, The Things They Carried was named by the New York Times as one of the 20 best books of the last quarter century. It received the Chicago Tribune Heartland Award in Fiction and was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Critics Award in 2010. Oh, sorry, Book Award. In 2010, he received the Catherine Ann Porter Award from the American Academy of Arts and Lectures for Distinguished Body of Work. O'Brien's other books include Northern Lights, Tomcat in Love, and July, July. His short fiction, which has received the National Magazine Award, has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Esquire, Playboy, Harper's, Granta, and many other places. I've had to edit the awards and honors in the interest of getting to tonight's event. So please now join me in welcoming Tim O'Brien in conversation with Toby Wolf. Which side do you work? Welcome. I'm sorry that not everybody could get in tonight because this is such a special night. First of all, I'd really like to thank Deborah Satz, who just introduced us. Uh, this whole project, uh, Ethics in War, uh, was her great inspiration, and she has been the driving force behind it. She's the one who brought us, who are on the committee, uh, to, uh, to arrange uh, this and, uh, and to, to help her in whatever way we can to, to, to bring this project to the university. It's a, I think it's a great and, in, effect, in fact, a kind of essential uh, project, and, uh, and I'm especially happy to have my friend Tim O'Brien here tonight. Uh, uh, last year was the 20th anniversary of uh, the publication of the things they carried, and I know that Tim was uh, really uh, in demand pretty much uh, constantly, and for him to have made this time for us was a great, uh, a great kindness to us, and one that, uh, that uh, that, that I appreciate, and indeed so does everyone else I, I can see. Uh, his last time here uh, was about nine years ago, and it, it, ever since then, those of us who were at his reading that night still remember this brilliant, brilliant story he read uh, that was part of his work in progress at the time, the novel July, July, dealing with the travails of a soldier named David Todd who's been wounded and is lying out in uh, uh, he's, he's alone, he's been forgotten, uh, and he's listening to Armed Forces uh, Network Radio, and all of a sudden the disc jockey or the, the, the starts addressing him personally. It is one of the most remarkable uh, pieces of writing I've ever heard, and, and I, it was a, a privilege to have been here, and now you're going to have that privilege uh, tonight and tomorrow night. Uh, so, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, for being here. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, I thought we might talk about tonight, uh, the subject is writing and war. We won't hold ourselves to that. Maybe we can just get on to writing. Uh, maybe we can just get on to war, too. <laughs> but but um, one, of the, one of the things that I've been turning over in my mind, and not just in regard to writing and war, but uh, uh, one of the events that we've had in this series was the viewing of a documentary about the great photographer James Noctway, who's done this fantastic work in war zones uh, and in afflicted areas of various kinds. And a criticism um, that's been brought against his work 
uh, inevitably, this always happens, it happened with Robert Kappa and, you know, is that it aestheticizes violence, that there is something, uh, if you will, perhaps corrupt about taking human suffering and making of it a kind of aesthetic experience. And, uh, and I'd love to know what, you, what, you, what your thoughts are about that. Well, my, my thoughts are complicated. One thought that crosses my mind is that we would probably have no Madame Bovary uh, if, that's, if, if to if make aesthetic an ugly person in an ugly situation. I think there would, there would probably be no literature. Yeah. There would be few movies. Broadway would go dark. <laughs> um, part of what literature is about is the study of and the contemplation of and a meditation on, on being human in all its aspects. And human beings, unlike, say, the gophers or the chipmunks, were aware of tragedy. Um, maybe, they, maybe gophers are too, I don't know. <laughs> but we are. And aware of horror and aware of despair and, and, and to, to dive into that wreck as a writer and try to salvage something beautiful that is beautifully made in, in harmony and proportion with language that, that can make the horror float and allow characters to confront it. Uh, I, I don't think that's a bad thing, whether it's with visual arts or with what poets do or fiction writers do or non-fiction writers, mm -hmm. is to, to elevate it somehow, to elevate our own um, suffering so that we can look at it and take a certain even take a certain pleasure out of our awareness of, uh, of error and failing and of sin and of so on to just by the hmm. awareness itself yeah well you know broadway may yet go dark if these spidermen keep falling out of the sky <laughs> but but um, you know I, i'm going to worry this this question a little more, uh, if I can, and, um, and it has to do with, um, with the fact that, I mean, you've written um, in the great tradition of, uh, of, of the Iliad and Tolstoy and Hemingway and Vera Britton and any number of people have written only really truthfully about war and, and I, I'm sure you must have hoped that at least one of the effects of this writing would be to make uh, the reader a little wary of wanting mm -hmm. to have that experience uh, himself or herself. And, uh, and yet, paradoxically, there's a strange attraction that grows out of of the literature and the films about war. I was reading this memoir of Anthony Swafford called Jarhead, and right. he talked about how before they went in on an assault, uh, it never really happened much. It was the first, uh, first Gulf War, which was really more like a kind of drive-by shooting. But it was, uh, they, <laughs> they went in, they pumped themselves up, his Marines, by watching Platoon. Now, nothing I, I, I could have been further, I think, right. from Oliver Stone's mind when he made that movie than that it would serve as uh, a device to make people excited about going into war. Um, that's an extreme example, but, but the truth of the matter is that in reading even books that leave nothing out about this experience, it creates this kind of flame to which Mm -hmm. Some of us are drawn, and I confess that I was one of them. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't, you know, I was reading Eric Maria Remarque, I was reading Hemingway, Norman Mailer, William Styron, and rather than actually, you know, take on the burden of what they were trying to say, I thought, well, I'd love to be able to have experiences like this and write about them later. Yeah. Did that 
in all honesty, did that, were you a kind of literary fellow who might have been affected in that way? Uh, no, I mean, I went, uh, I went to war kicking and screaming, not for love of adventure. I was terrified of dying. Still, I'm not happy about the prospect. <laughs> and, 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 but, but when you're 21 and you're opposed to a war as I was, um, that a good many of my friends, like you, Toby, went there for you know reasons of adventure and to find oneself and to have a, something, a, 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 a kind of male adventure. Um, I wasn't one of them. However, I must say that I'm in complete agreement with everything you just had to say because one of the, I'll go home after events such as this one and I'll t tell my wife, you know, this book signing afterward, after I thought I'd made this impassioned plea through literature to watch out for violence and watch out for wars and they aren't happy things and some inevitably, wherever I go, some I don't know if kid is the word, but they look like kids to me now. Some 21, 22-year-old guy will come through the signing line and say, I didn't really much want to you know, join the Army or the Marines, but when I read your book, it made me do it. <laughs> and that's kind of what you're talking about. It's like as if you wrote in Bottom Bovary and somebody said, I decided to get divorced because I read your book. Or marry, divorce yet. Or drink poison. Or drink poison or all the, <laughs> to use novels as models of, of it, but they do. There's a draw toward adventure that I, I is the word you use was paradoxical and that is the word. Yeah. I, I, in so, in, one aspect of my personality is a, a kind of sense of failure, that I came to writing The Things They Carried, If I Die, and Cacciato, those three books for sure, but I think my entire work, out of a kind of bitterness and anger that I came home with bearing from Vietnam, I was angry at my country, and I was angry at my fellow soldiers doing nasty stuff, and I don't mean shooting people, although that too, but I mean just a nasty daily, hour by hour horrors of war. Things you don't read about, they never make it onto television. Just the, this context, this web of nastiness, and I was angry about it. And you spend a career writing about these things, trying to pull back a veil and show the petty horrors of it all along with what you may expect from a book that deals with war, and then have that kind of experience, it breaks your heart. Yeah. And yet I think, as much as I feel a failure in that regard, I, my books have not stopped wars, so too is Homer and yeah. Tolstoy and Hemingway, that I can't believe they were writing pro-war books, I'm sure they were not. They were, in, to one degree or another, hoping to humanize us through exposure of, of, to ugliness uh, in literature. The, 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 the consequences of what we write, we're not in control of them. You aren't That's and right. I'm not. What we are in control of are trying to make good sentences with some rhythm and beauty to tell stories that have a, a resonance of layers. And that's what we, that's what we can do. Well, we can't control that kid out in the hallway who uses that artifact, that book or movie, platoon, yeah. to, uh, you know, to march off to do bad stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I have to say that, you know, I don't want to give myself too much credit for hunger for adventure. When I joined the Army, I was just 18, <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I was thinking, frankly, of going to Germany at the time, as we weren't really in Vietnam very deeply at that point. Uh -huh. By the time they actually got me there, I turned 21 a couple of days after I got there, um, I was like you. I was thinking, you know, uh, I remember flying into that place and the helicopter and thinking, my God, what have I done, you know? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, uh, so, no, by, I, yeah. I, you know, the, the, the taste for adventure had left me by the time I actually got there, I have Good. to say. Good. Um, yeah. But uh, I, I, it brings up that, that, whole, that whole question uh, um, of, uh, you know, 
Uh, being uh, Clausewitz writes in his uh, writings on war that the ideal soldier should be 16 because um, after that you actually can begin to imagine the possibility of your own death and 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 that's true I mean right. and and it one is. of the characters I think uh, the characteristics of, of, of the war that we were in was that there were a lot of people who were drafted who were mature people mm -hmm. and who were asking questions and were informed. That's a real liability in, in, a, in a troop of soldiers. Is a, uh, I mean, not, I'm being facetious. I shouldn't be right, not on this subject. No, uh, no, they should be informed. But it does, it does create a complicated soldiery. And, and, uh, uh, and it was, I think, one of, the, one of the things that there were so many young men like mm -hmm. you there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I agree that I felt as if I were surrounded in Vietnam by, even from, by those who you know, hadn't been to college and would never go to college, but who were informed about, through newspaper and t television, if nothing else, if not through, you know, more scholarly stuff, were informed that there was another, there was another hemisphere to this war, which is uh, the anti-war movement. And, questions about that were mentioned in, in the introduction about what do you die for? What do you kill for? Yeah. Those questions were asked back in that era and they're not asked much, I don't hear them much on, you know, from Tucker Carlson and, and yeah. Bill O'Reilly. They don't, it seems as if that, those questions have become in a way less relevant to our discourse than they were then. Hmm. It makes for, uh, I mean, for example, I, not many people worry allowed at least, about the, there being no weapons of mass destruction having been found in Iraq. It was our, not just one of the reasons for going to that, going to war there, it was the reason. <clears throat> All you have to do is remember Colin Powell. And in, it, 40 years ago, that would have broken hearts and there would have been anger. Uh, it's almost as if no Pearl Harbor had happened. Yeah. We went to war at Pearl Harbor, it wasn't there. But you don't hear it worried about in our discourse or talked about much. Maybe every eight or nine months I'll see a mention of it and that's it. And uh, that, is, that, that, that phenomenon carries over, I think, to the contemporary soldier in a lot of ways. I was sent by your and my favorite magazine, Parade, a great <laughs> intellectual journal. I was sent to Brook Army medical center in uh, San Antonio where there are, are burn casualties and our amputees go. I mean, they, these are really, uh, these guys are fucked up guys. They are mutilated. Some with no arms and no legs. A fellow I interviewed uh, missing uh, a, a leg, but so horribly burned that he had no nose, no ears, no lips. This kid was mutilated. Um, and I asked him, well, was it, was it worth it? And he looked at me with a kind of mouth open and he said, what do you mean? I said, well, was anything achieved by it? Did, did you feel like you did anything? He said, well, I did my duty. Hmm. And nothing beyond that. There was no questioning of was the war. I said to him, well, there were no weapons of mass destruction there. Did you feel deceived or betrayed? Or? He said, I didn't think about it. And that mentality strikes me as odd, having come from an era that you and I served in, where everyone thought about the rectitude of our involvement in Vietnam. There were debates in foxholes about it, especially when you're around a guy like myself, who would, you know, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd say things like, I don't know what I'm doing here. And yeah. man, what we did today was terrible. We, and we didn't win any war. We, in fact, we did the opposite. We created more enemies by our behaviors today. That kind of discussion, um, based on what I learned at that hospital, certainly among those guys, not much, is, is, is not at least as deep and as dense yeah. and as overwhelming as it was, in, in, I think, in our era. Well, one of the reasons, uh, it seems to me, that there was such an intense conversation about causes and, and, uh, and the justice of the war that we were involved in was that Every, almost everybody out in this audience at that time would have been subject to be sent there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that isn't true anymore. When you think you might get sent there, you take an interest. Yeah, and, right. uh, and, you know, it's human nature 
not to take so much interest in things mm -hmm. that don't seem to bear on your likely fate. And uh, it isn't, a, it isn't a really a kind of moral crime, it's just a natural thing. Yeah. But uh, there's a quiescence here and that burden of service, mm -hmm. which used to be to some extent shared uh, uh, equally, mm -hmm. has been lifted and it has been placed on the few. And I think that may be part of the reason. There's been quite a lively conversation on this campus about the possibility, or not the possibility, which does not seem at all uh, likely, actually, but, but the, the, the rightness mm -hmm. of reinstituting a draft or some kind of, of universal mm -hmm. service so that this kind of thing would be, you know, uh, an, an exercise of citizenship for everybody. Mm -hmm. what, what would you think about that? Well, I'm conflicted. I have two little. I have two little kids. I have a five-year-old and seven-year-old. My first. They're two little boys, and to, to, to imagine they're going off to even a just war is. I to, and to maintain a silence and say, "All right, go fight the just war." I, it's hard to imagine it. So it's even harder to imagine uttering the words. Maybe there ought to be a draft. Yeah. Especially by someone who was ensnared in a draft. Myself. I was not a volunteer, I got drafted, and I would not have gone to Vietnam had it not been for a draft. Um, to hear myself say, maybe there should be one. Because in Sioux City, and Dubuque, and uh, you know, Org, Iowa, if that wolf is not at the door, and your son or your daughter is not gonna be dragged away to that war, as you say, it, it's, it can be pushed aside out of consciousness. It's not in front of you. Um, and I, it's, I kind of return to the word paradox that you used earlier in the discussion, which is our terrain as novelists. We're interested in maybe this and maybe that, where there is very little room for absolute declarations. I'm not going to stand up here and absolutely declare there ought to be a draft. But I can imagine writing a story, a piece of literature, about, say, being a guy on a draft board, and I'm in charge of, I'm, I'm winging this, but of drafting my next door neighbor's kid, and his, his name has come up. And to make a story of it in which the complications of it all, you hope through literature, become palpable and real, yeah. the kind of tension of watching that human being doing something with that human being's life, sending him off to, to a, into combat or to a war, that, I, that without issuing political or, or um, judgments about it all, but the complications of it all, to say that there ought to be a draft, I mean, I, I'm, I can't bring myself to do that, but I can bring myself to say the wolf is not at the door that yeah. for most of us. Yeah. It's only at the door for those who whose children want to go, or for those of you who are of age in this audience who want to do it. For you, the wolf is kind of at the door. Yeah. It does, um, that ability that this gives us, the remoteness, let's say, of our obligation in these situations, uh, does indeed permit us to kind of put these things at a remove in our mind and uh, there's a wonderful passage in your story uh, on the Rainy River in, in which the narrator, soon after getting his draft notice, is beginning to think about just what he might do and to react with rage, really, to being yeah. caught up in this. And, and he says, you know, people who make these wars, there ought to be a law that they serve. The people who are so enthusiastic about doing this they should be the ones who, who do it then. And, uh, yeah. and, he, and he keeps saying, there ought to be a law. Ah, there ought to be. And, you Maybe know, I will become a politician. I found myself nodding I mean, with agreement, you know. It just it seems so hypocritical. I think among all the vices of, the, of humanity, the one that gets to me the most is hypocrisy. It really makes me angry. Yeah, and out of one mouth comes this declaration, but the body is doing something different. I declare, you know, our, the war in Afghanistan is really good and we ought to be sending more troops over there and stay there for eternity. 
and make them learn English and everybody. I mean, and they're sitting in their safe little TV studio yeah. making these declarations, well, what, not, not putting their body where, their, where the rhetoric is. Yeah. And it's that hypocrisy that, that even back in all of those decades ago now in Vietnam that used to make me burn inside with a kind of fury that it's hard to, it's hard to express the depth of the fury. Oh, yeah. it would just, It'd, it'd infect my dreams and it'd infect my daily thoughts as I'd walk around thinking, you know, those, those people in those safe television studios and their safe Kiwanis clubs and their safe, you know, rotary clubs and churches making these declarations, well, why the hell aren't they here if they're so hot for yeah. it, doing the killing and the dying? And why don't they send all their kids? If you're so for it, send them all and your grandkids. And, your aunts and uncles, and send them, make them go. Like, say, you gotta go. How you do that, I'm not sure, but become a little mini government or something and make them go. <laughs> and I, even now, you can tell in my tone that I really, the hypocrisy with which we can make these easy declarations for other people to go kill and die and not do it ourselves seems to me very, very strange that we just so docilely accept it. Yeah. But we seem to do it. The, the things that enrage me, I think, have enraged writers who write about the stuff I do f for centuries now, and I think I don't see much uh, change on the horizon. But I think that that's part of why, when one is engaged in writing stuff such as you and I have both done, it has to do with with war. That we're dealing with a subject that feels as to go back to the turtles or whatever emerged from way back. Certainly Homer was dealing with it. Yeah. Well, it was very interesting to me to watch the way your mind worked on this question of the draft. You became a writer. I did. You started yeah. writing a story about a guy on a draft board. Yeah. Uh, your mind works like that. Was it working like that when you were a young man in uniform, what, were you seeing what was happening to you already through the eyes of someone who was self-consciously uh, amassing this experience with the hope of turning it to some good in that way? I, I think I'm going I'm to turn the tables on you in just a second and ask you the, exactly the same question, <laughs> but I'll give you my answer since you started. I, th I think I, I attacked it the way, the way you would if, if life delivered a divorce to you. Your mom mm. and dad are getting divorced. I didn't will it. I didn't like it, what I was going through. But I was interested in my own life, as a, partly as I was engaged in it, partly as I was witnessing it, enough to try to kind of organize it in my mind. Um, and the way my mind organizes things is through story. Mm -hmm. I can't talk intellectually in a scholarly, academic kind of way about a subject for long without running out of language yeah. because the language seems in inadequate to me, whereas moving to a guy on a draft board who's paper, you know, the kid next door is being is my next name, and the th to make a full story out of it where you go into a head seems to me to make real that which is abstract. War is among the most, it's just the word war is an abstract war word. And all the, the, the linguistic machinery that we have for talking about it seems to kind of distance it. Keep it away from us. Whereas story does exactly the opposite thing. It immerses us in it. And for me, as, as a 22-year-old guy in Vietnam, I was, I think, thinking of my life as a kind of story that I was living, um, conscious of, will I live or die? There was a kind of a built-in plot, what's going to happen at the end. Yeah. Will I behave well under fire? Um, or will I just cower and say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, as I did the first time around, and the second and the third. It was just, <laughs> God, let me live to the point where I didn't, I didn't even look at where the enemy was. I just put my rifle up and shot. And Dad, I didn't care if I hit anything, just sort of to make him go away. Just, <laughs> just make a lot of noise and you'll leave. And slowly the story changed as I lived it. And I was aware of that. 
And I was also aware of my own anger and rage at what felt like a, f a forfeiture in my own part. I felt angry at myself for the default of going to the war when I knew it, in my case at least, it was the wrong thing to do. You don't, you don't go to war thinking it's the wrong thing to do and start killing people when you think it's wrong. You, do you go to Canada or you go to jail or you hide in a you know, tunnel or you do something? but not what I did. So I, that was part of the story too. So I was conscious of these things, but I was so embroiled in the daily, the minutia of being in a war that I wrote very little, maybe 20, 30 pages in Vietnam itself, handwritten stuff, just as notes, by and large. What about you? Did, when, were you, you said you were 21 when you, when you yeah, arrived? I turned 21 when I got there. We were uh, the same age. A, we were then. Um, yeah, and I, I, I had already formed the notion that I would, wanted to be a writer. Um, and I did uh, sort of a, a confession. I mean, I, I thought, okay, I'm get, while I'm here, I'm going to set, lay the foundation of this. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, so I did it in the form of letters that I sent home to my brother and to my mother, and to the uh, young woman I was uh, then engaged to be married to. And I got all the, and then, uh, you know, I collected all these letters when I got home. And, uh, but I didn't write about it uh, right away. I wrote about something else. I did end up writing a very bad novel about Vietnam, and, and uh, but, but not relying on these. So, when I finally made up my mind to do it, some 20, oh, 20 years, yeah, like you, yeah. uh, you know, I, I waited a while. No, you did it in sooner than I did. But anyway, I went to consult these letters that were going to be the basis of this uh, work, and they were just crap. They were, <laughs> they were totally untrue. Uh, I had been... They were literary. They, I'd been stri oh. It's funny, here I was actually there, actually having real experiences, and I was writing home literary experiences from books I'd read. And uh, they were totally useless. And so, you know, uh, they, I mean, I can't even begin to say what I left out of it. That sense, for example, of growing corruption that I felt over there, the, the, uh, the, the, the horrible way we treated the people that we were. Uh, I was with a Vietnamese unit and when I was over there, uh, and, uh, and I was very aware of how Americans treated Vietnamese, how we dealt, how we had to constantly go into American base and steal things if we ever wanted anything that worked. And there was just a kind of corruption to the everyday, yeah. uh, you know what I yeah. mean. And, I and there was even a vocabulary around it, an ironic yeah. vocabulary around for every corrupt thing you did. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you became habituated to it and you became dull to what you mm -hmm. did and calloused over in the worst mm -hmm. ways. And it took me years for that stuff to wear off to the point where I could actually deal with my memory honestly and write mm -hmm. honestly about what happened over there. But, um, I, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a hard experience to write it. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, though, that I think also makes it hard, and I guess I've just touched on it, is that there is such a powerful tradition of writing on this subject. And so many conventions now have been built up around it. Think of the classic American war story with the patrol. You've got your Pollock. You've got a guy who wears glasses. They call him Doc. You've got, you know, I mean, I can go, you know, it's the microcosm of America. And, um, and there's just one, and Vietnam, gosh, by the time even you came to write it, your book mm -hmm. in 73, was already so encrusted with cliches, the yeah. helicopter coming out of the mist and that right. kind of jazzy vocabulary that people, yeah. to this day when people use the word nom with me, I just, yeah. it's like salt on a slug. I just want to <laughs> go like that. And uh, I mean, 
I remember, you know, it reached its apotheosis for me when I saw that movie, uh, Trading Places, with Eddie Murphy, and he's, and he's posing as a Vietnam vet, <laughs> and he's on a skateboard like Porgy in the, in the park, faking it, and, and he starts telling about all the secret ops he went yeah. on and all this, and he says, well, hell, he says, I was Agent Orange, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so there are all these incredible uh, almost ossified conventions and uh, uh, expectations about how you tell a war story, you take that mm -hmm. on very, very squarely in your book. I mean, what, what encouraged you, what, what, what gave you ways of refreshing this experience in your writing? Well, I'm not sure I have an answer to that. All, all I know is I'm wholly aware at every moment of the struggle to do so, that you, yeah. you do have to go beyond convention and, and expectation. And it's a, I look at it as a, as a challenge that, of content, to make the content press it beyond the, the killing and dying. Yeah. And which are, those stakes are obviously very high, but there are higher stakes of morality and of, rec, you know, how does one comport, one's, comport oneself in situations like that? What's, what, what, what is the role of con conscience in a society that is a democracy? Does it matter not in, at all if, say, tomorrow we were to invade Toronto and that's cool, it's a democracy, if our majority has agreed to do so, let's go do it. And your conscience is, I don't know, God, I got a girlfriend in Toronto, she's nice and they seem like nice people to me and they don't seem to be hurting us at all. What do you do? Uh, especially, say, if you're a military person. And I know there are some in this audience who have either been in the military or are in the military. Is there, a, is there a point at which you say, no, I'm not going to shoot that old guy, or, or, or no, I'm not going to go to that war, for, even for a military person? Or is it just, yes, sir, going to do it? Let's go, let's go kill Canadians tomorrow. Hmm. What do you do? And that goes beyond the, at, least the, at least the conventions of, say, you know, testing oneself under fire, sort of the Henry Fleming Red Badge of Courage convention, which I don't to, to cry in any way. It's a great convention, but it is one. And, and to test oneself that way, I, as a writer, seems to me important. The, uh, the, the answers to how you do it, for me at least, I'm sure the same as yours. You do it sentence by sentence line by line, character by character, even syllable by syllable, that I think you think of yourself as much as a, as a, 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 you're as much a poet as you are a, a fiction writer. There's, to be a good fiction writer, you have to have a poetic sensibility. The, role, the, the language matters. How a thing is said determines what the thing is that yeah. is being That's talked right. about. And so my struggle, really, as a writer, is not with war and, and big thematic stuff. It's really on the sentence level of, not even the sentence level, the phrase level and the syllable level, the rhythm level. And out of that, if you're paying attention to that, your body as a writer, at least mine, is kind of moving. And I, I'm not mystically talking about like hearing stuff coming at me, but I am muttering to myself, little phrases, doing dialogue that way, and something, content will come out of that. Well, that's nom for you. Garden of evil. Over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. <laughs> that's a line from the things they carried, of dialogue. Well, that's nom for you. Garden of evil. Over here, man, every sin's real fresh and original. It's after the baby water buffalo's being shot. Well, I didn't intend, the, I, all, I, all I was aiming for in that little bit of dialogue was dialogue, something to be uttered, and sort of capture a kind of speech that wasn't faked Eddie Murphy Nami, but it felt real to me. And out of that comes, came a discovery that I didn't know I knew, which was that, that it's a play in this Garden of Eden thing, you know, the Garden of Evil, but original sin, I think I discovered for myself, means that it, these sins have been done forever. They've been done through eternity. But when you do it, when you're involved in it, it's fresh. And it's original. It's 
brand new to the world when you do it. It may have been around for eternity, and it may be around for, you know, until long as the human race is here, but when you commit it and you're involved in it or witness it, there's something, and it comes out of lingo. It comes out of that, those, those syllables I was talking about earlier. And that's where my real interest lies. It lies in getting the, 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 the contest of combat, which, I mean, beyond just plot combat, the combat of the mind and the combat of conscience with itself, through language, through finding utterances uh, by, through characters or through narrative, that enlarge the, 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 the sort of the en enduring mystery of it all. Why, why do men do these terrible things? Yeah. Why do we do these things? And I have no answer. I just want to explore the mystery, and maybe even, maybe even make it more mysterious. Yeah. That's my real interest. Yeah. I think yours, too. Well, yes, and I mean, one thing that, that just has to strike any reader of your work, especially those pieces that touch on, 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 the, on the war, uh, is that there are, you know, you look pretty uh, far and wide to find anything like a, a, a shootout. It just, you know, yeah. that's not, not there. Yeah. Uh, you might talk about the aftermath of it suddenly, yeah. you know, the freshening aspect of the world mm -hmm. and the newness and miraculousness of, 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 mm -hmm. of, of being alive yeah. and that exhilaration. Uh, but that traditional kind of uh, excitement right. promised by war, uh, w the art, uh, art of war, that's not what you're after. That it, not only that, I can't, I mean, maybe like you, I've noticed in your books too, you, you too have you no know, shoot em up stuff. And part of it has to do with I can't recall it, my, I can't recall it well. I recall, all I really recall is kind of generalized chaos. Yeah. And with a kind of fear base, sort of chaos on top of utter terror, and that has a that has a that, that erases memory. You're so yeah. overwhelmed by it that memory evaporates. And after a battle or a firefight is over, in, in this is in Vietnam, I would go to talk about it, and our memories would be about what, what happened. They'd be radically different. <laughs> you know, they were over there. No, they were there, and. Yeah. Chronologies get scrambled, and so when you go to write about it, I'm left with a I'm left with a kind of ignorance of my own experience. I can't re remember much. It's been so. Um, maybe there's a deadening thing, a psychological deadening thing that goes on. You want to erase it, so maybe the mind has a way of sort of, I don't know, pressing the horror down a little bit. Um, it, as you say, what what what. I end up writing about probably like you is sort of aftermath stuff. It's what you feel afterward and what you carry with you out of it for the rest of your life. Um, and what, 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 what you tell your children and um, yeah. things like that. Well, Tim, I think, uh, you know, you're only a, a, a writer about war in the sense that all great writers are writers about war, and that is that they write about the war with Inside, themselves. Of with themselves, and uh, and that is always where your eye is. It seems to me, and um, I, you know, I'm I'm going not to stay in the way of you and mm -hmm. and your readers uh, anymore. I want them to be able to ask you some questions, but I just want to say. Um, uh, that I consider you one of our great writers. Thank you. And, uh, and I thank you for being here. Thank you. So Tim, Tim has agreed to uh, have a conversation with you tonight, so it's up to you to begin it. There are microphones here for those who have questions. Hi, my name is George. I'm a sophomore here at Stanford, and I have a question for both of you. Um, I was wondering, sort of in the wake of the Tucson shootings and sort of the prevalence of drones, you know, fighting our, our wars in Pakistan and Afghanistan, kind of the general increasing detachment and at the same time prevalence of violence in our culture, 
I, did you or do you find that our society has evolved or is evolving into one that simply tolerates and encourages violence? Mm. Well, I'll, I'll answer with a kind of story. It's my, my, it just popped into my head, so I'll say it. As I mentioned to you guys earlier, I have a, these two little kids. The younger one, his name is Tad, he's now five. I caught him in the bathroom about, I don't know, a year and a half ago, peeing into a wastebasket. And not just a wastebasket, but a wire mesh wastebasket. <laughs> and, and, teachable, and, moment. <laughs> a teachable moment. Teachable moment. And uh, I said to him, what the hell are you doing? And why are you doing this? You're, and he's five. He knows better. And I, my, there was a, I don't know how to say this, there was a certain earnest tone in my voice. Of, I was angry. It, I spoke pretty sharply to the point where I... <laughs> I paralyzed the kid. He tried to shift his aim over toward the toilet and <laughs> kind of made it halfway. And he, he, he looked up at my I, because partly of Nam, I guess, and partly because of my just temperament. I don't like even contention in voice. I don't like loudness, shrillness. When people begin yelling, it, 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 it's, it's this chalk against blackboard thing you were just talking about. It makes me feel bad about it the world. Anyway, I, I retreated to the, my st study and I let my wife take over the disciplining stuff and about, about an hour passed and my, this little kid, Tad, came into the study and he said, Daddy, Daddy. And I said, what? And he said, I've got two heads. And I said, what? And he said, I said, you've got two heads. And he said, you asked why I did it and it's because I've got two heads. One head said, Daddy's not going to like this. <laughs> and the other head said, this is going to be fun. <laughs> and that, that night, there's a tradition. I'm, I'm answering your question. I know it's a back door way, but I'm really, I'm really almost direct. This is not too back door. That night, there, I, I tell these kids stories. I'm a writer, and so I make up my own stories. I don't just read to them. I tell my own. Sometimes they're just horrible, and sometimes they're pretty cool. But that night, I said, uh, the two, like a t you know, Timmy's lying here and Tad's there, I'm in the middle and the lights are out. And I said, once upon a time, I knew somebody with two heads. And they said, really? And they, I said, yeah, his name was Daddy. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Tad, the, the little, the, the younger one, started, you know, kind of looked at my neck, like looking for the scar <laughs> where, the, where the stump was of the... And I said, I said, no, no. And then I went on to tell the, the story and the things they carried, in, for, but for toned way down, the Rainy River story, the going to the Canada story, but toning it way down, how one head I'm carrying around through, through college and into, through basic training and over to Nam was, was, I want to be loved by my country and my family and my hometown and I love my country and I don't want to leave it. I don't want to go to jail. And there's this head. And the other head I'm carrying all through these same years is, a, is a, exactly the opposite head. It's a head of, I mentioned earlier, of anger and of conscience and of this is wrong and I shouldn't be doing this. And, and these two heads have been talking to me for 40 years now, a long time. One, sometimes one head will get the edge, the other won't. Well, I am not the kind of person, I carry two heads about everything, any subject, spaghetti, I've got two opinions. I mean, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'm always looking at the other side. I'll make a declaration and I want to make the opposite one. And what I'm trying to say is that I think violence is, for me at least, is born out of absolutism, of, of black and white. I'm right and you're wrong. There is no argument allowed. Declarations about the world we live in. This is the truth. And I hear it every day, all around me, in all kinds of guises, as we all do. All you have to do is turn on the television set or pick up a newspaper. And it's around us. The, 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 there's a, something that soldiers learn, too, about abs. We're taught to be absolutists in basic training. 
The spirit of the bayonet is to kill. And you yell it 5,000 times. You're 18 years old yelling the, the spirit of the bayonet. I mean, bayonets are these inanimate things. The spirit of the bayonet. Uh, and, uh, but there's an absolutism to it all that, that I, I feel is that the, the, is in the bedrock of, of the root going into the bedrock of, of what violence comes out of. It comes out of, I am so right that I can kill you. Yeah. I am so right about it. And yeah, the mental illness feeds into all these things, as yeah. it does in Tucson, but that is a form of mental illness, in my view. Yeah. Absolutism is a kind of mental illness, I think, and maybe one of the most destructive of all. Yeah. I'm curious to hear what Toby says. Well, I, I have really very little to add to that uh, because I so agree with, with everything you said. I think we're uh, the fact that we can are not even a, that that so so deep does this absolutism run that we are not even allowed to have a conversation right. about these things uh, without the thing being shut down. Uh, uh, you know, I heard heard the other day. I hadn't been aware that uh, of this statistic, but we have lost more of our countrymen here to handgun deaths than we have lost in all of our foreign wars put together. Whoa. And we are not allowed to talk about this. It oh. just gets shut down. There is no conversation about it. And, uh, and that, that bothers me and I, and, uh, uh, you know, that there is the, you know, uh, I don't, I, I, I can't believe we're the most evil country in the world. Uh, that our people are the most evil people in the world, so what conditions are we creating here in which this takes place? Mm -hmm. That, yeah. you know, that's a conversation we need to have and that we are somehow not allowed to have. Yeah. And, uh, and it will go on until we, we are able to, to yeah. face ourselves I with think some so. honesty. Another. Hi. Um, I am a teacher for juniors and seniors who are in a hybrid college and high school program. And um, based on an impending interview that one of our students is having with Senator Boxer coming up soon, he may be headed to Annapolis next year. This has been his plan for years. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, I, I find myself often teaching to him and thinking of the position that he will someday be in. And I'm curious what sort of advice you would have for him or what sort of you know, wisdom you would want to impart upon a student at this age who has this particular goal. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't maybe Toby has some advice. I, I, I really don't have any. It's, it's, it's like having children when you, you the, we often we embark on their own paths, this young man, a young man, right, is embarking on his path. I don't understand the path, doesn't mean it's right or wrong, but that's because I don't like getting out of bed at you know, four in the morning and <laughs> running 5,000 miles and all the stuff you do at Annapolis. I don't swim, so I wouldn't be too happy on the first cruise, but that doesn't mean it's not right for that person. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what I would say. I would, maybe Toby has something really <laughs> cool to say. Not, nothing, but, nothing much of pops to mind. I must. No, I, I think that military service is an honorable life. Um, and uh, it is a very challenging life. The series of this uh, un, uh, under which we're here is ethics and war. And one of the questions that we probably should have talked about tonight that uh, maybe troubles us all, can, are those two words, can they be in the same room together? Can, mm -hmm. can, uh, can we have ethics while we are at war? Where, you know, can, can human nature survive the challenges of a war and, and remain ethical? And, uh, and in relation to violence, what happens? Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I am not a pacifist. I cannot imagine uh, what would have happened to this world had we not resisted uh, uh, Nazism, and, uh, for example. And, uh, and I honor people who serve 
honorably, and that it, I think it's a I think it's a great life. But uh, um, you know, it, it's a it's a very challenging life. It's a very difficult life, I think, uh, especially when you actually have to uh, en enter the hazards of war. Uh, Thank you for this uh, very wonderful, rich conversation. I appreciate it very much. I'm an anesthesiologist. I work at the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital. And your discussion, um, particularly about the hospital scene, um, was quite profound and disturbing on many levels. I would say that I've had some very Disturbing experiences too, working at the Veterans Hospital and um, seeing the lifelong effects of war on men and women. Uh, in particular, when the, um, when the Iraq War was starting up in 2003, there was just an amazing uh, outpouring of empathy by the veteran patients who were just about to go to the operating room regarding um, the soldiers who were about to be deployed to Iraq. It was um, really impressive how well they were able to express that. And so my question is about um, what I perceive to be, um, what you alluded to, some differences between the, the current outcrop of veterans that are coming out of the Afghan and Iraq wars compared to say, previous experiences, and if you could explore that a little more and talk a bit about writing the veteran experience as well as the soldier experience, because there really are some powerful scenes in, say, the things they carried about veterans. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, as Toby said, and I, I can't help but agree, if I'd love to disagree with him, but I don't is it takes a different kind of cat to volunteer to go to a war and to go into the army it takes a, than it takes to be a drafted one, to be dragged out of, I had a full ride scholarship to Harvard, to grad school, I had life by the tail, and bam, it ends. And I, my, so I couldn't envision in a trillion years volunteering to go into the military. Um, not, not for, political reasons have nothing to do with you know, what the honorable life is. It has to do with lifestyle for me. I do not like flies and bugs and dirt and <laughs> guns and that's all noisy and bothersome. Even if there's no killing involved, I'd hate it. Be like Boy Scouts, advanced, you know, PhD Boy Scouts. I wouldn't do it. I'd get a doctorate in something else. Not that it's bad, but a different kind of animal volunteers. Um, no better, no worse, but different. And it's the kind of person who can tolerate things that I found intolerable in the, just a military way of life. I did not like saluting my inferiors. <laughs> and I, how do you get used to yes sir to some dumbass, can't spell cat, you spot him all the vowels and consonants. And, I mean, it, it, it drives you nuts. And I'm not exaggerating much, am I? I mean, not that they were all that way, but some were. And there's, and I'm using a facetious example, of course, to get at something pretty that I was talking about earlier. It's pretty serious. How I'm not the kind of, of my temperament, the kind of person that would say, "Yeah, let's go get, the, let's go invade Fiji tomorrow," and not ask why or is it the right thing to do. And part of being in the military is, you're, is yes, sir. You don't say, maybe, sir, or let me think about it. <laughs> but let me go off to take a leave at Stanford for four years and you contemplate it. You say yes or you say no. And you better be yes. It didn't, um, or, or suffer the penalties. Some of the great heroes, military heroes, uh, in my memory are those who were able to utter the word no. Among them, say, that helicopter pilot at My Lai, Hugh Thompson, Jr who, looking down from his helicopter and sees uh, you know, mass murder going on for four hours of non-stop, well, there was a stop. They took they had a lunch break and then killing more people. And he landed his helicopter and they, he came out, got out of his helicopter and he told his door gunners to train their weapons on 
uh, a group of American soldiers and say, if they keep doing this, kill them, shoot them. And he marched over and said, you're going to stop this. And he got as many of these little babies and kids and old ladies on his helicopter as he could. It's a small helicopter, but he, I think there were 12 he got on or seven, something like that, flew them away. Well, that's a, that, there should be a statue of that guy beside every statue of a Sherman or a Custer or a, a Eisenhower. The, the courage that it takes, not just physical courage, though there was that too, there was death all around that day. But the courage of putting your career on the line for yeah. forever. He was intimidated afterward. He was harassed. He got hate mail for his entire life afterward. He suffered terrible consequences for an act of great courage. He was a military man through and through. He was a military guy, but of the best sort, capable of, you know, of, of uttering that word, no, of conscience and so on. So, it's not, it's that, it's that, that is the, the, we were talking right at the very start of this conversation about do you make war too beautiful and, and, and make, there are moments of great beauty. There were in concentration camps and of sacrifice and of nobility, of, act, of, act, of, sub, of sublime human behavior that's all the more sublime by, by its juxtaposition and immersion in in, 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 in barbarous inhumanity, all the more glorious as, as Thompson's behavior was that day. That's my, that's my t response to the men I talked to at Brook that day. They didn't care much about rectitude issues, but they did care about their individual behaviors in, in, in combat a lot. That's what they wanted to talk about, not about politics, about weapons of mass destruction, they wanted to talk about what they be, how they behaved on that day in those circumstances. That's what they, and uh, bravo for that. I know that the war was not a pleasant experience for you, but first off, I would like to say thank you very much because if it had not been for the whole experience, I would not be blessed enough to either exist or be here at this moment. Um, that being said, um, it's very difficult for me to bring together everything I've heard about the war from my parents' side, from what I've seen, and also what I learned in school. I would like to ask, um, during war, often it, you have to demonize the opponent in order to carry out what you do. And then the entire experience from a soldier's point of view, it's very, it's very horrific, it's very gruesome. However, going back to Vietnam, it's very hard for me to imagine that any of this ever happened. Oh, so how would you say, um, would there, is there any kind of resolution that you might come to by going back and seeing how the place has settled down a bit or perhaps developed? And do you find it hard to reconcile the way Vietnam is now with the experiences that you've had yourself? Well, yeah. I mean, you're looking at a guy right now who's wearing this white shirt, and then the, it's a Van Heusen, and it says in the back, Made in Vietnam. And I wore it intentionally tonight. I mean, I've got other shirts that don't say that, but this is just a... <laughs> common J.C. Penney white shirt. And I returned to Vietnam in, uh, I think it was 94, and I don't know, Toby, have you gone back? No, I haven't. It was, you know, I recommend it, if you can afford it, and I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a, it's a, it's, there's a beauty there I missed the first time around. Yeah. And I'm including physical beauty to the, the country that because I was so terrified, I did, the tree was ugly to me because somebody might be behind it shooting at me and mountains were scary and water, everything was scary because it all might kill me. And I saw just the, the physical beauty of the place. I saw for, from the people though, more importantly, uh, you're, uh, you're right in what you said. It seems impossible to believe that these were the people the, you know, the, this horror to what was happening and it was dealing with us and went both ways. It seems impossible. So forgiving, so, so wanting to laugh about it. I learned um, that we were just, a, our real American war there was just a blip on the radar screen, you know, of wars. There. It was just, it's called the American War and it, it's nothing compared to the Chinese wars. And, um, it's a blip, and uh, 
for, uh, kind of largely forgiven one at that. There are a couple of exceptions, but by and large, um, to, to, to hang out and have get drunk with your enemy. The word enemy no longer means it. The stupid word doesn't mean it. You're not an enemy. Um, he's your drinking buddy, and you're making jokes about, you know, we, you were so easy to see because you were big and you were noisy, and we're making jokes about how it's hard to see you because you're so tiny, and we just couldn't find you. And <laughs> it was... It, it was jocular and it was fun to, and the, it's a little bit like watching now in, uh, now and then on the History Channel or A&E, there'll be these, there's a, there are clips of the oldest living Civil War veterans, you know, they're these grizzled old guys and their white beards meeting at Gettysburg to shake yes. hands. I think some of you have seen these clips. Oh, yeah. and it's kind of funny to watch it, these old, and it's, uh, I have the same feel as I watch these 95-year-old guys, a few remaining, you know, shaking hands and laughing about it all with none of the bone-killing animosity there and hatred and terror. It's just it's evaporated, which makes you wonder, which is the real world, that one or this one? Which goes back to what Toby and I do for a living and for fun, I think, it's at least sometimes fun, is to tell stories about it. And when I can get a, when I think of a story that is appropriate to a question such as yours, I'd run with that in a million years. And uh, I've got one, but we're too late in the, in the evening to recount it. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Taylor, and I'm studying um, international relations. And I've studied, I've done a lot of research with post-traumatic stress disorder. And so uh, reviewing the things they carried, I, the story about, I think his name's Norman, and he drives around the lake and then ends up killing himself, that really, really stuck out to me this time. And in the story, you sort of, you, there's a bit of a letter where he says, you know, I don't want to complain, I don't want to be weak. And right. then you juxtapose that with your own experience about, you know, I, was, I didn't really suffer this trauma in the same way because I, had, I was able to write and had this outlet. And it seems to me there is so much violence when people don't have an outlet like that. Violence against themselves or this domestic abuse is a big problem. Or even just in the societies that we leave behind, them trying to cope with the violence against them. And I'm just wondering if you have any ideas or any suggestions of how we can teach people, how we can give them the tools like you had through your writing. What are some other kinds of tools and how do we give them to people so that there isn't so much violence lingering after these originally violent experiences? Two tools for what exactly? I missed that. Just to, to cope with the trauma. So that this, it seems like if you can't cope with the trauma, then there's more violence that, you know, against oh, yourself or others. So how do we I deal see. with this? Well, I have a very unpopular view on this subject. That maybe Toby, this will be our first disagreement, but uh, I'm, I'm of the, of a you know, great minority view, I know that, and I'm, I'm kind of scared to say this, but I'll say it, is that I, I worry that there's not enough trauma. There's too little after combat suicide and despair and frustration and broken families and, and psychiatric commitments that it feels to me as if we as humans tend to heal too well and too quickly and too thoroughly, and the scabs are too thick so we don't feel much, that I think you are nuts if you come back from what I went through and you aren't nuts. <laughs> A little bit. You're crazy if you don't have late night anxiety. And I'm talking now about post-traumatic stress symptoms that are, you know, you run the manuals, and uh, if you're not, if you don't have uh, uh, anger issues inside of you, I think you're crazy that you're not human. You might as well be a, you know, that gopher I was talking about. Um, I feel that one of the ways to deal with trauma is to be traumatized, to, to acknowledge that I was hurt and I'm still hurting, and to acknowledge what I did to hurt other people. There's, there's three million Vietnamese we haven't even mentioned tonight that suffered a little bit too, that aren't part of our discourse when we talk 
when we talk about our own veterans having their troubles, the Iraqis got their troubles too. And the Afghans got theirs, and the Vietnamese theirs, and it feels so self-centered and complacent and egocentric to, to focus on only our own concerns. That bothers me. At least widen it beyond that discussion. You don't hear much of the widening. You hear a hell of a lot more about our, our, our men and women uh, suffering their, the consequences of that war in Vietnam and our two, but you hear very little about the other side. Now and then you will. You better be on NPR or you won't hear it though. <laughs> better be tuned to that than the New York Times. Or you're not, you're not gonna hear it in Des Moines. You just don't. You better be tuned to a couple of, you know, that couple of channels on television and not, not others. So that's my, I, I, was a, I just talked to a room of shrinks in, in uh, Washington. At, it was a, kind of, just, it was about, these are professional psychiatrists dealing with post-traumatic stress and, and I've made this pitch to them and it meant much more, I mean, I actually wrote a speech and the sentences were good and I'm kind of winging it here. But uh, I'm not sure I made any friends in that room um, because my, my feeling is that, that I'm not sure you should cure certain things. I don't, know, I don't know, number one, if they are curable, I'm not sure they are, but I'm not sure you should. Um, yeah, some of the s terrible symptoms, suicide, okay, let's not let's talk them out of it and let's find ways to deal with it. But I don't think late night suffering and anxiety and depression ought to be entirely cured. It's just a normative issue. But beyond that, I don't think as a medical issue that they really, at least in any meaningful way, be cured. I know it's not a popular view, but I want to go to the grave defending it. Okay, hi, I'm, I'm Greg. Um, I'm a West Point class of 68. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> first of all, I gotta go. <laughs> so, so I was one of those dumbasses you didn't like to salute. Anyway, um, first of all, I would like to thank the young lady from across the way or that spoke earlier about uh, thank her for her thanks. It's one of the very few uh, thanks that, uh, meaningful thanks that you get for doing what we did over there. Uh, I very much appreciate that. Um, thank you. But uh, the point I want to make is uh, something about uh, my concern about the leadership class of this country. And prior to going to Vietnam, I, by the way, I was a, a, a senior advisor to a Vietnamese infantry battalion in the Central Highlands. But prior to going over there, I was an infantry company commander in Alaska. And in, about, in the company of about 120 people, we had four or five individuals, which, I, which were uh, McNamara's 100,000. Now, for those that aren't familiar with that phrase, that was when the uh, draft, the, the inefficient, unfair draft system we had at the time wasn't able to produce enough warm bodies. They lowered the metal standards. So, like I say, four or five of these individuals showed up in our unit up in Alaska. They had IQs around 60 or 70. So this country made the moral decision to, to draft the mentally feeble while letting people with college deferments get off. And then when we came to the run-up to the Iraq War, if you remember the term chicken hawk, where a lot of the individuals that were advising or ad advocating uh, the invasion were people that could have, should have, ought to have been drafted, but they were not. And they were making decisions. So what I propose, or I ask a question, is let's, can we turn the McNamara 100,000 program on its head and go out and draft a limited number of people per year from people, from kids like, that are in this room, who will then be the future leaders of this country who may, won't make such blunders as that. Um, I just wanted to get your opinion of doing something like that. A, a very, as they say, a selective draft that tries to pick the top echelons of uh, people that would go to places like Stanford or the Ivy League or whatever. How about Maybe Jeff? we should take a vote <laughs> of the people in the, in the room. Or how about just Stanford? <laughs> <laughs> it's a thought. 
I got a couple candidates around this place that I'd like to see get drafted. Tim, Use your imagination. Tim has been incredibly generous tonight with his time. I think that if we uh, have one more question to crown the evening, uh, if there is anyone, uh, other, yes, okay. And then this, this, this will be the last question. Uh, and uh, thank you, Tim, so thank much you, for me. how much you've given us tonight. First of all, let me echo everybody else's thanks for the chance to, to, to listen to you and to speak with you. My name is Bill Vosberg, and I, um, I taught your um, uh, things I carried for many years to high school uh, juniors and to freshmen uh, students in college. And um, uh, almost entirely, my, my students found the book moving, compelling, interesting. Um, since I'm a male teacher and it's about... Uh, um, Male Activity, Men Off to War, written by a male writer, I would frequently uh, check in with my female students. Does the book move you? Is it something that's powerful and attractive or, or engaging for you? And the answer almost always was yes, very much so. And my question for you, I guess, would be is, um, and for both of you, I guess, would be, is, is that how is it then that the stories of, of war about which you write uh, are, tra are above, they transcend gender? I guess that would be, maybe we should ask the, the ladies in the audience also to, <laughs> about this too. We shouldn't have a male asking two other males this question. But well, I can kind I, of have a female reply. <laughs> <laughs> Toby, no, through the back door. Uh, I had a letter that came, uh, I don't know, about a year ago or a year and a half, somewhere in there, from a young woman, 26 year old woman in Minneapolis, my home state, Minnesota. And it began in kind of the standard way, Dear Mr. O'Brien, I would like to thank you for your book. And then she told us a story that it would be hard for me to recount for you, but I'm going to try without, without tearing up. She said, uh, I lived in a family where there was no talk between my mom and dad. They seemed, in fact, to hate each other mm. well, in, in deep, deep, intense ways. She said, at one point, I remember thinking as a... As a uh, a sophomore in high school, that she was more a counselor than a daughter to her mom and dad. Uh, at one point, her mother confessed to her that I have never loved your father, ever. This is page one of the letter. She said on page, of a short, a two page letter, a short letter, she said on page two that one day in, in, in eight P English class when she, I think she was a junior in high school, she was assigned the things they carried and brought it home and gave it to, after finishing it, gave it to her dad to read um, and then to her mom. She, he, she, the young woman said that for the first time the, there was talk at the dinner table that was at least had, a, had humanity underneath it. She said uh, that she used to, she learned at the dinner table that her father was a Vietnam veteran. He'd never been mentioned by him or the wife. It was unknown to her that he had been a soldier over there. She said she, she'd seen it under the bed in the basement. She'd found some artifacts of, that she assumed were military, but they were odd artifacts. And one was a triangle off a stripper's bra that came from some stage show in Vietnam. Odd little odds and ends. Um, she said that, that, at the end of her letter, she said, my parents aren't perfect now, but they're still married. And it, the a book began a conversation that's lasted now for, well, how many years was that? Like seven, eight years, well, quite a while. And if literature, I mean, I didn't know this family. I didn't write a book to repair a marriage or keep people together. But literature can have that effect now and then. It can do things that are real in human lives. They can be bad things, like that kid I mentioned to you earlier said, yeah, I joined the Marines because of your book. <laughs> but they can be good things, too. We sort of, they're out of our control. But literature is not this, this docile lapdog over here that doesn't do things in the world. You learn when, from the letters that we writers get, you learn the effects of, of what we call literature is like a, like a, it's almost like a dirty word because it seems, seems uh, feet somehow hmm. has very powerful 
doings in the world. It can, mm. it can do things to the human, human lives. And that, um, that's a young woman who was affected by a book in a tangential way. It wasn't a direct, you know, actual military kind of way. It was a, her family life got at least better, if not good. Um, the second thing, and I'll let Toby kind of conclude the, with this, is that I can't tell you how many letters I get. I get more letters from the wives and the lovers and the girlfriends of veterans than I ever gotten from veterans themselves. I mean, from soldiers in Vietnam, Iran, or Af Iraq, or Afghanistan. And the letters pretty much all say the same thing. It's, dear Mr. O'Brien, my, my husband, boyfriend, father won't talk about it, can't talk about it, and I, which has been tough. And I've been able to learn at least something through the, this book or that book about what it is he's feeling. And it may not be all of it, but at least it's a door that's open where I can at least learn to ask what questions, to, I can learn what questions to mm. ask my father. And, or boyfriend, or if not even ask questions, at least feel something what they've gone through. And those, those letters mean much more to me than, than letters that come from veterans. Veterans know what they went through. I don't have to tell Toby, what did you experience and how do you feel? He knows. But for those who are uh, associated with um, people who have been in, in wars, there's a, there's, a, there's a silence that comes from many veterans, probably mo vast majority of veterans, I think, that uh, is hard to overcome. And, and literature is one way of, one way of uh, o opening doors that way. Well, what a perfect end of the evening. Thank right. you. This program is brought to you by the Stanford Humanities Center. For more information, please visit us at shc.stanford.edu. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.